All right, we might make a start. Um, hello and welcome to today's ANZ PacBio Bioinformatics Workshop Series on Genome Annotation, brought to you by PacBio, Millennium and AGRF. My name is David Hawkes. I am the Brisbane Site Manager at the Australian Genome Research Facility, and I manage our PacBio SQL 2 platform. Last week, we covered how to take HiFi reads and create a contact genome assembly. To quickly recap for those of you who are not able to attend, Paul from Millennium spoke about HiFi library prep, detailing how circular smart bells allow a polymerase to repetitively loop around the same molecule. This repetitive sequencing forms the basis of HiFi reads, which are very long, very accurate, and greatly reduce the bioinformatic component for genome assembly. Key Pin from PacBio took us through bioinformatic tools that use HiFi reads to produce genome assemblies. Among the assemblers, IPA, improved phase assembler, and HiFi ASM are both standouts. Both are extremely fast with IPA showing great scaling on a cluster, and both have the ability to phase the genome. HiFi ASM having the additional benefit of being able to include high C or on the C data. Keepin also covered quality assessment tools and contig scaffolding. Next, Professor Heng Lee, creator of HiFi ASM, SAM tools and BWA, among others, spoke about phasing genomes using HiFi ASM and calling complex variants. Next, Gareth from QCIF covered capabilities available from Biocommons and Galaxy Australia. Carolyn Hogg from the University of Sydney spoke about her real world experiences using PacBio data for conservation science. I encourage anyone who's interested in genome assembly to check out the video recording of this workshop. We'll try and provide a link to the YouTube video somewhere in the chat. So, now we have a good genome assembly, what next? Well, for many, the next logical step is to annotate that genome. Genome, genome annotation is another area where PacBio data can be particularly useful. The ISOSIG application is capable of generating full length transcripts. And this information can be mapped back to the genome assembly, detailing gene locations and exon and intron boundaries. It sounds simple, but there are a lot of elements that need to be considered. Today, our panel of experts will dive into this area and provide a picture of what is possible and how you can achieve it. So for the next two hours or so, this is our agenda. We'll begin with Paul, who will give a brief overview of the chemistry and library prep behind ISOSIC. Next, we'll delve into the bioinformatics of genome annotation with key PIN. Uh, then Gareth will describe the resources that are available through Biocommons and Gallup Australia for help with your genome annotation projects. And finally, we have Liz Seng from PacBio, the creator behind the ISOSIC algorithm, who will describe some real world experiences using um, ISOSIC. During the presentations, you'll be able to ask questions by entering them into the chat. There's also a question and answer section, which makes sure your questions aren't lost. Some from the panel will do their best to answer. And at the end of each talk, there will be a few minutes to ask your questions. Um, and we'll enable your mic uh, if, if you need to. So just raise your hand. Um, finally, at the end of all the talks, there'll be an open panel discussion. So uh, let's start. I'll just switch off my video. Stop sharing. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Paul Gooding. Paul is the laboratory expert of this panel. Paul competed, completed his PhD at the John Innes Center in the UK uh, before moving to Australia to work at the Syro plant industry, focusing on post-harvest quality fruits and vegetables. Paul has worked at the University of Adelaide running the Serial Genetic Transformation Facility. He has worked for many years at the Australian Genome Research Facility, working across a suite of Illumina next-gen sequencing platforms, as well as genotyping and microbial profiling projects. Currently, Paul is the FAS at Millennium for genomics portfolios in Australia and New Zealand, and of particular interest today, he has a wealth of experience in PacBio sequencing. Paul will be giving a brief summary of HiFi Seq library prep and sequencing. Great, thank you, David. I'll um, get my screen shared for you here. So, yes, so I know everybody um, on the call today is really keen to, to get into the, the bioinformatics and, and rightly so, it's very important. So um, I will, as David said, briefly skip through something that of course is important. Um, you know, we, we, we want quality stuff in to get quality data out. So we need good sample prep and, and library prep and things. So we'll just skip through a few of the things that, um, that are important um, and, and what you need to consider. So um, today, I'll just 
uh, a very, very brief reminder of what David said about what is hi-fi data um, from uh, 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 those of you that saw the talk last week. Um, um, uh, it's just a, a very brief um, recap on that. For those that weren't able to attend, then maybe it's just a, uh, a way of you understanding how we get hi-fi data from, from our, our smart build molecules. Then we'll then talk about um, what is IsoSeq um, briefly. So uh, as Dave said, it's, it's um, sequencing of the for link transcriptome. And then onto the, the, the meat of it, and that's the key considerations for the sample prep um, to, to get the best quality data that you can. So um, yeah, here we go. We'll start, we'll start there. So um, for those of you who've seen this uh, last week, but to say just a refresher um, uh, and with a slight edit here, um, what we do is we, we, we can sequence a piece of, of DNA here. So last week it was a piece of genomic DNA here. I'll just relabel this. It's going to be a cDNA insert because we're, we're sequencing our RNA. So we, we take our RNA, um, we make that into cDNA. Uh, once you've got this linear molecule, you're able to put the, uh, the smart bell ends on uh, and bind a sequencing primer and a polymerase. And round and round it goes multiple, multiple passes around the molecule. Of course, your, your, your um, isoseq um, um, uh, libraries are probably quite short two three kb probably um so you're able to make multiple multiple passes easily around that molecule get very 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 accurate data and it's this um very accurate consensus read that, that we call hi-fi data and uh, as i say it's uh, it, it's greater than 99.9 percent .9 accuracy um in um, almost all cases now so um so that's uh the brief reminder of, of how it all worked. So um, we'll flick to the, the next bit, um, which is the what is ISOSeq. So ISOSeq is full length cDNA sequencing. There's there's no need to assemble. And, and I suppose the diagram on the right just tries to describe this briefly that um, because you're able to sequence all of the full length transcripts as they uh, exist, you don't have to piece anything together, which is, the, I guess, the weakness of having to try this through short read sequencing. Uh, and in many cases, of course, with short read sequencing, you just haven't got the length of read to see all of the intron and exon junctions and be able to stitch together everything to make every single isoform that exists. And, and the more and more isoseq um, is being done on PacBio, the more completely unique isoforms uh, are being discovered all the time. So um, uh, this is this is um, ongoing, of course. Um, and of course, you could do this for um, um, the whole transcriptome, certainly. And uh, and some people also um, uh, make targeted capture, so they they have some kind of baits pulled down. Um, um, to target for, for a particular um, set of genes that they particularly interest in, say immune genes or, or whatever it is um, that they're targeting for their panel. Um, so you can do that too. Um, and the advantage, of, as we said, it just is able to discover all of those novel splice um, um, variants and, and, and such like. So you've got the, the novel genes and isoforms um, fully discovered. Um, and I guess then going into the bioinformatics part today, um, that we're going to discuss this second point here, and that's certainly to improve genome annotation um, uh, with or without a reference genome. So um, um, the, the ability to understand all of these um, transcript forms um, uh, enables you to, to, to get a much more accurate genome annotation. And, and uh, that, I guess, will be the thrust of the, the next uh, couple of hours. OK. Um, and uh the 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 ability um with with isoseq the things you can do essentially is um is the the library prep is um about a day um the sequencing um because the the molecules are quite short because they're transcripts um the the length of movie time that you take um to to take this real-time sequencing is, is also quite short so the sequencing is done in about a day and um and the data analysis itself which we'll, we'll be running through is also very very quick now so a day so you can go in that three-day process from your sample through to um, a genome annotation um you know in in comfortably inside that that, that working week and, and um, no assembly required so that's um, hence why it's um, so quick um on a, a SQL 2 the the smart cell 8m for uh, genome annotation um it's probably recommended to to multiplex up to about eight but in fact some some groups have shown that um, they can multiplex up to 12 samples per per smart cell um, um 8m um uh, and uh, and get the data that they need to to um to perform that genome annotation um if you're trying to do a 
full transcriptome profiling um, kind of analysis, then it's um, it's it's one one sample per smart cell, and um, um, and and the analysis tools that we discuss are, are all um, all available for this. So. The key consideration is for, for, for getting the best quality data that you can. Okay, uh, this is a kind of quick work, uh, workflow um, uh, going through. So you start with your total RNA and, um, and obviously you need to do a QC of this. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss this in the next uh, slide or so coming up. But um, you need about 300 nanograms of total RNA input and that RNA has got to be of a reasonably good quality. So we, 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 we talk in RNA um, integrity number or RIN score. We want a RIN score off your bioanalyzer of um, you know, as good as you can get, but certainly over seven. Um, um, and as it says in brackets, they're ideally over eight, but the, the, you know, the higher the number, the better, but um, certainly over seven. Um, we're then going to run some um, sort of first strand um, synthesis. So we're going to bind a uh, primer to the poly A tail that's on the transcripts and, and, um, and generate a first strand. Then there's a, um, a template switching oligo. Um, uh, the, the enzyme puts on three Cs on, on the five prime end, and then we can have a primer with three Gs to bind to that as a template switch oligo. And so we can make our second strand um, and, uh, and, and move on from there to get our full length um, cDNA. Um, and then we can go on to make our, our pack bio sequencing library, the so-called smart bell library. Um, and that's all, um, um, in, in, in a, a procedure that's uh, that's available for, you, for your sequencing and then it goes on to the machine for the sequencing itself and um, and away we go then into the data analysis which Kim and co will be talking much more about um, as we go so um, just to get to um, the quality um, assessments to, to to get your best chance of getting the best best quality data as I said we need to get um, uh, an assessment of the quality of your RNA um, Treatment of your of your sample obviously is is critical here. Depending um, whether plants or animals or whatever, you know, you you want to try and get that material at, at, at the best stage that you can. It needs to be snap frozen and looked after. You can't let it freeze thaw. All of these things degrade um, RNA very very quickly. So um, you know you need to work fast and work cold when you're when you're preparing it. So all that's important. But once you've got your RNA and there's lots and lots of, of really good commercial kits for taking RNA out of all sorts of tissues, plants and animals, and all sorts now um, you want to put a drop onto the bioanalyzer and um, and uh, get an idea of your, your your the amount you've got for a start um, because we said we need about 300 nanograms or more um, but also the the quality and uh, the RIN score is is essentially um, a, a measure of the ribosomal peaks in in your um, your RNA and the ratio of those peaks to one another um, any change in the ideal um, uh, um, ratios will indicate that you've got degradation of those products and, and therefore the machine makes an estimate of the quality based on the amount you've got and, and the ratios of those ribosomal peaks. So um, we want to RIN um, greater than seven if we can. The other thing that's really important is to get an assessment of the uh, purity um, uh, of your sample. Um, and we can do this with a spectrophotometer, nanodrop in, is very common in many labs, but there are options there, of course. Um, but we want to, to measure the, the 260 to 80 ratio, for example, um, with DNA, it's a, a, a perfect ratio, it's about 1.8. For, for, for RNA, it's about two. Um, and we also want a 260, 230 ratio above two. So there, there are a couple of, of, uh, of the points that we, we need to sort of um, get our, our, our checkbox for. Um, so any changes in those ratios will indicate some sort of contaminants um, and that can be a number of things it can be protonaceous material you know polysaccharides it can be phenolics um, polyphenolics from plants is very common um, and on also some carryover from the extraction kits and and things that um, that, that can also cause some problems um, so the nearer we can get that 260 to 80 to ratio to um, to two um, the better um, and uh, and likewise for your 260 230 ratios 
um, we, we want it to be greater than two. And again, um, changes from that can, can indicate carryover of, of other molecules such as carbohydrates and, and uh, glycogen and, and such like. Um, so just at the box at the bottom, if we can get uh, a 260 to 80 ratio between 1.8 to 2 uh, or higher, it is, um, it's probably going to be fine. And a 260 to 230 of, you know, between two, two and a half um, is, is going to be great. So we're fairly confident then that our sample is clean and, uh, and is RNA. One other thing to consider, maybe slightly less critical, but we want to obviously do our extract, extraction and capture RNA for the isoseq. We don't want to get contaminating DNA, genomic DNA in there. Now, there are PCR steps involved in, in making of the library. So you're going to amplify anything with a poly A tail and, and therefore with a template switch at the end. Um, and so this helps overcome uh, trace amounts of, of genomic DNA contamination. But, um, but obviously we want to keep that minimal to start with, otherwise this can cause some, some, some issues if you're starting to capture that and sequence it. Now, uh, again, you're probably going to dial it out because of the application of the RNA. You can probably also dial it out a little bit in the bioinformatics process because you're going to have the introns and, and things that, that shouldn't otherwise be there. So you can probably screen that data and, and, and filter it out. But we, we want to um, not lose our, our real estate on our, on our, on our smart cell um, with this. So um, the more you can minimize that, um, the better. Now this next slide is, is a little bit busy, but just trying to illustrate um, uh, the way that you're, you're going to make these libraries. And um, the recommendation is to use the, the PacBioIsa Seek Express um, kit in combination with this um, um, NEB kit, um, the, the, the single cell low input cDNA synthesis um, and amplification module. Um, and it uses a combination of, of, uh, of, of, of barcoded primers. Um, and uh, so you're able to multiplex your, your samples. But essentially, as I said, you're binding a, a poly DT to the poly A of your, of your RNA and making a first strand. Um, and then that, that's um, you're coming from the NEB kit. Um, and then you can bind the template switch oligo from, from the back bio kit and then um, continue on with some extra PCR steps to make your, your full length um, um, transcriptome library um, ready for the sequencing. So that's a, a very, very brief overview and, and there's lots more detail in lots and lots of documents. Uh, but uh, um, that's enough for today, I think. Um, the other little tip or trick uh, that some people do, obviously you've captured your, your RNA you've made cDNA, there are some cleanup steps using some um, magnetic beads, Pronex beads, in fact, are recommended. Um, but you can, by altering the bead ratio, just slightly bias the size of the regions you're capturing. And it's just demonstrated with three different size um, sort of selections here. You can select a sort of average around 2KB to capture most of your, your regular transcripts, I guess. But if you have sort of some sort of a priori knowledge of, of, um, of your species and there's some transcripts that you're particularly interested in that are short length, you can actually adjust the bead ratios to capture that short material. Or as a lot of people do, they enrich for the slightly larger. So what they'll do is they'll take two aliquots of their RNA, um, they'll do the cleanups and take a, a you know, an, an average one to, you know, to capture most of that mid-range, but then they do another capture for the, um, the long transcripts um, that are a little bit rarer and, 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 and in, the, in that whole population. And then they pull that together in some ratio or other so that they've got a, you know, a, a good cut of the, of the major transcripts, but they've also enriched a little bit for some long transcripts and, and and then sequence those as well. So they get a little bit overrepresented then in, in, in the, uh, the final sequencing. Um, so yes, that's what a, a lot of people do. Just a sort of summary here of, um, of what can be done on both the SQL, the older SQL system on a, uh, using a smart cell 1M, with 1 million holes on, on, the, on the smart cell or the, the, the SQL 2, which has got 8 million. Um, you need a little bit more uh, material for the, for the larger chip. Um, but um, there are lots of recommendations in, in the uh, procedures that you can uh, you know, download from the PacBio site, or if you can't, please contact us at Millennium Science, we can help you out. Um, but there's all the, um, the recommendations for um, the amount of CDNA amplification, the number of cycles you need, um, and uh, if you're doing this little bit of extra pooling or enriching um, uh, what might be required um, to get things um, optimal for you. 
So I think um, that's about it. We'll move on um, now. I hope that's giving you just a taste of, of some of the things to think of, but it is important to try and get um, good quality RNA and, and to, um, to make sure that you've got your best chance of making the best libraries to get the best sequencing data to go forward into the, into the analysis. So um, with that, I'll uh, stop sharing my screen and uh, perhaps hand back to, to David to um, just, I don't know, monitor any questions or, or anything that, um, that may be required. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, definitely. Um, I'll just, uh, is there any questions? If, you, if anyone wants to put their hand up quickly for a quick question for Paul um, while we've got him here. Um, Paul, while, while we're waiting, I'll, I'll ask a question for you. Uh, it's a question that I sort of, get from the laboratory side um, and, and you touched on multiplexing um, <clears throat> and maybe this is also a question that maybe Liz might have uh, some input on. Um, you can multiplex up to eight or 12 samples onto a smart cell. Is it the primary function to do different samples or is it the, the idea that you're multiplexing to get different tissue types of the same sample so that you get a better um, representation of the transcripts across the genome. Um, That's a, it's a great question, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it from my prior experience, if you like, um, when I was um, in academia. And, and for me, um, I'm a plant um, um, molecular biologist. Um, I actually found it critically important to get a feel of, of the transcriptional differences from different tissues. Um, and that, that was more my biological focus, I suppose. So, you know, we were looking at roots and leaves and stems and seeds and, you know, inflorescences and things. So we were looking, and of course, there's quite startling you know differences in those transcriptional profiles but even where it appeared with the, you know the older methods um uh, that the transcri transcriptional activity was similar what you weren't seeing often with the 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 next gen data the the short read you weren't seeing the the different isoforms that were there so um and they they can be critical and my understanding is it's it's just as critical if not more so in 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 mammalian research i mean you look in human brain and things like this there's a, there's a lot of alternative splicing which is really really critical to get those balances and and um they're kind of gradients across across tissue layers and things so um i guess they're my comments liz if you've got anything to to add to that now's a, a good time i would say it's exactly what you say because for the purpose of genome annotation and it's not just theoretical we've actually seen it in in our plant iso seq data that there are isoforms that are only expressed or dominantly expressed in certain tissues and conditions so actually one of my slides We'll talk about this. It's like if you didn't multiplex them, you wouldn't see some of the isoforms. I'm also using this to answer one of the Q&A. Is there an advantage to a five cap library preparation? Um, I have an answer, but maybe I'll let you guys talk about it too, since you're the provider. Uh, please go, Liz, that's fine. You're, you're, you're in, that's great. Okay. So yeah, I mean, like, as you know, that our current, the, the standard protocol that uses the, um, the template switching does not do five cap trap. And I'd say that every now and then we have customers who are very, very keen on getting that five from cap track. And there is a uh, kit, the Lexigen Teleprime V2 does offer that. That said, um, actually one of the papers that I will talk about had said that Teleprime offers a mild advantage of capturing the five prom end. I, I would say they, they don't at all argue that uh, Tila Prime captures all of the five prom um, ends. And I think there's another thing to think about is that if your RNA is naturally degraded, would you rather be able to annotate at least some of it, even if it's missing 10 or 20 bases, or would you just say, I will have all or nothing? I think this is the unfortunate reality, right? And, and then that goes back to having a really high quality RNA sample almost always gives you very clean five prom ends. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Um, just reading another questions coming in the chat. Um, is there an optimized protocol for RNA extraction, which gives good, good quality RNA from avian tissue? Um, Paul, maybe there's a, a resource from BackBio? Yeah, there, there, there's certainly um, a resource. It, it, it's extract DNA for, for PacBio, which, which really concentrates um, more on genomic DNA, but there are some resources within that for RNA. I have to say, again, from experiences, um, uh, uh, I, I think 
there's a lot of very good commercial kits uh, and, and they, they work very, very well. Um, I won't go through manufacturers' names, you know who they are, but um, you know, they're, they're all really um, um, pretty good, they're in column based methods in, in, in many regards. Um, but for me, uh, again, it, from this experience, the, the key here isn't really so much the kit, it's the quality of the starting um, material. Um, I have done some work um, with uh, collaborators in the past with um, bird blood um, and, uh, and, and also from um, feather um, uh, tips. And um, that the key here was actually um, managing to, to capture that material be before the RNA was starting to degrade. Now, there are solutions that you can put feathers and tips of feathers in uh, uh, to try and stabilize. There's homemade ones and there's commercial ones. Um, but I think that the, the kit itself for the, DNA, for the RNA extraction, there's lots and they're all uh, pretty pretty good um, but getting that start that starting material at high quality is is key and unfortunately there's there's no shortcut to this I would recommend trying to get some non-critical samples and starting to optimize these things for yourself so you know um, um, you know make a plan try try some tissues and if you get good quality RNA then great if, if you don't then um, think about changing a couple of steps or, or whatever but um, I'd be happy to discuss this offline more yeah if you need um, I'll just I'll just throw in one last question, and maybe this might be answered in some of the later talks. Um, how many of the isoforms that you get from Isoseq are artifacts? Right. So the, actually, we will talk about tools that will give you that. I don't think there are a fixed percentage, right? Because, uh, for example, if I give you a neural gene, the answer is all of them are real. <laughs> well, some of them aren't, but many of them would be real. So I think that's a uh, I would say, like, keeping, we'll talk about the uh, the rules for filtering and then my, my deck about talking success stories. People really drill down to, like, what exactly are real and what exactly are not real. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll see. And I, I think as the databases improve, this is, is, is always going to be a, a moving goalpost for this. Yeah. All righty. Um, we'll, we'll move on. Um, so we'll, we'll introduce Keep In. Uh, keep In as um, completed his postdoctoral degree in the computational study of proteins. Um, his research integrated genomics um, and transcriptomics data to elucidate insights into the evolution and resistance uh, mechanisms of cancer. Ki Pin is the FAS bioinformatics scientist at PacBio Asia Pacific. He brings a wealth of knowledge to long read bioinformatics. And today he'll be talking about ISOSEQ with his talk titled. Um, was ISOSEQ one-on-one raw data to transcripts. Thank you, David. I'll share my screen. All right. Good morning, everyone. Hi, um, I'm Ki Bin. So I'm a field application scientist with PacBio. Asia Pacific. So for today's talk, I will be going to review ISOSIC 101, raw data to full-length transcripts. So just to recap a little um, on Paul's introduction to ISOSIC method. So we know in conventional RNA sequencing, it is very hard to resolve complex splicing because of the uh, reads that's not long enough to actually span over all the um, splice junctions. So with isoSeq, you actually can um, go through all the transcripts without any assembly because the length is long enough to span over every gene. So if you look at the example here on top, sorry, is the gene and then going to R mRNA isoforms. And then um, finally, you have the full length reads and there is no assembly required. Hi-Fi reads provide accuracy for isoC analysis. And you can see that going from the double-stranded DNA on top to each of these uh, smart belt adapters, the um, polymerase can actually go through the DNA in multiple passes and results in high fire rate states on average 99.9% .9 accuracy. We have workflow end-to-end -end solution going from library prep to smart sequencing to data analysis in one day, and you can refer to our web page for the best practice recommendation. The Isosync Express kits, as Paul has introduced, requires only 60 to 300 gram total RNA, and it produces full-length cDNA with multiplexing support. 
On a SQL2 system, you can generate up to 4 million full length reads using one span cell AM for whole transcriptome annotation. Our workflow solution recommendation is shown on this screen, where you have it starts from sequencing who, that generates a circular consensus sequencing read file, ccs.band file, going into isosync analysis, which is provided by PacBio in SmartLink and on command line. You, we also have transcript classification using a third party tool called Squanty, which I will go through in a little bit more detail. So this is the tool that will allow you to um, generate some quality control metrics as Liz has mentioned. Further downstream, you can actually run um, other tools such as ISO anode and TAPAS to generate functional annotation as well as differential analysis. This will, sorry, this will output um, annotated GTF as well as um, allowing you to do differential analysis by using an experimental design setup. Other tools such as Cupcake, Cogent, Tama, and Talon can be used to um, carry out other functions such as coding genes reconstruction, as well as collapsing redundant transcripts. And there are multiple other scripts such as scripts for single cell analysis included as well. For the workflow in isoSeq, going from genome annotation, you can actually run isoSeq analysis, following with Squanty for transcript classification if you have a good reference. You can use Maker or Augustus for the situation where there is no good reference available as well. Functional annotation can be done with ISO anode. For differential ex expression, the extra tool that you will use is tools such as TAPAS. DESIG can be used as well in some situation for um, if you have uh, if you have to be familiar with that tool. So phasing two can be phasing can be done with a tool called isoface, which um, Liz will also talk about later on. This is still a tool that's constantly developing. Uh, but it works reasonably well for now. Squanty3 is a tool that I mentioned that can actually generate quality control by taking in a long read defined transcripts generated by SmartLink with a reference genome fast A file and a reference transcriptome such as those from um, gene code with optional input such as rna seq data, cagepeq data, poly-A motifs for to actually generate a set of classification file that tells you whether the transcripts are novel or not and carries out a set of quality control filter to generate a final high, high quality curated transcript set for genome annotation. As you can see, Squanty3 has um, a few major categories that it classifies transcripts into. The first being full splice match, which is um, transcripts where it matches the reference perfectly. We have incomplete splice match that matches reference partially, novel in catalog, which is novel isosomes using known junctions, and finally novel not in catalog, which is novel isosomes using novel junctions. There is also other categories such as genic intron and genic genomic. So I'll use this um, terminology later on as well in some of the later talk. Functional isotranscriptomics analysis, which is uh, uh, short form stands for SPIT, can be done with uh, um, tools such as ISO anode, where you will generate expression matrix, experimental design, as well as annotation file that can be done with Squanty, as well as ISO SIG analysis tool from PacBio. Using them as an input to a tool called TAPAS that will allow you to actually generate functional diversity analysis, differential analysis, as well as, well as functional feature analysis. You can even add in short reads data if you have them to actually improve your analysis. Isosync method on the SQL2 system is comprehensive. So shown here is the data that you can download. Um, it's publicly available. You can download it on our website. It's actually an Alzheimer brain tissue sequence on one smart cell AM. And we generated 160,000 transcripts ranging from 80 to base pair all the way to 14 base pair at a mean of 3.3 kilo base pair. The number of genes generated here is about 17,000 with 160,000 isoforms just on one smart cell AM. Many of them are actually known, but many of them are actually novel as well, especially in the categories of isoforms, as you can see. For full length um, transcripts, as you can see, using this data set, we generated 32,000 full splice match. 
19,000 in complete spice match. And most importantly, in this Alzheimer's brain tissue, we actually were able to see many novel isoforms with known junctions at around 84,000 isoforms. 25,000 of, we, of um, these isoforms actually have novel junction as well. Squanty also uses CagePeak to actually quantify the transcripts, um, the, the poly A site. So the polyadenine, sorry, polyadenylination site, as you can see, most of the category actually um, are within uh, 50 base pair of the CagePeak. Uh, for the incomplete splice match, as far as novel junction, they, they are um, of course going to be slightly lesser, of, lesser annotated compared to full splice match. Many of them actually have known poly A motifs detected. So in um, full splice match, for example, 70% of them actually have um, uh, known poly A motifs or poly A motifs can be detected at the end of the transcripts. Shown here is a screenshot of the data generated and you can see that ISO SIG is able to capture from one, from the five prime end to the three prime end, very comprehensively, and is able to characterize the alternative splice, splicing pattern uh, very well. Finally, when we take when we took the isosic output transcripts and map it to a reference transcriptomes, we were able to see that the alignment identity is generally more than ninety nine percent accurate, showing you the high accuracy of isosic using PAC biosystem. This is an example output of Squanty using this data set. And you can see that it categorizes the isoforms into different categories and tells you what is the proportion. So for these brain samples in particular, as you can see, there is actually more novel isoforms compared to known reference. In some other um, more well annotated tissues, you will, you will actually see that um, the majority of the transcripts can be in as um, full splice match rather than uh, the novel um, tissues rather than the novel um, transcripts. This is what um, Liz has mentioned as well, that it really depends on what you are sequencing. I will now go through isosic analysis workflow uh, step by step on a, using command line. So if you have SmartLink, which is our graphical user interface, it is actually very easy to run isosic analysis in uh, a few, just a few clicks. But for those of you who is interested in the more technical aspects of um, isosic where you want to perhaps customize each step of the pipelines, you can actually refer to this website, which is isosic.how. And to actually look at some of the usually frequently asked questions, as well as tutorial on how to actually go through the analysis. This includes in the single cell analysis as well. The goal of isosic is to generate high quality transcripts full length non concatenate reads and to map the um, reads to uh, reference genome if you have one to actually collapse some of the redundant transcripts. It helps to remove some of the um, simple artifacts as well as to trim away the poly A tails. So on a very high level workflow, you can see that isoseq um, analysis goes from subreads to CCS so in most of the new projects where you are using a SQL 2E, for example, you actually already have ccs.bam file. So you can start from step two. Starting from ccs.bam file, we will remove the primers with a tool called Lima. And this is called demultiplex primers. After removing the primers, if you have barcodes here, it will also remove the barcodes and actually um, splits the reads into different um, barcodes. In ISO 3, three refined steps, we will remove a artifacts called concatema, which is what happens in the library preps when you have two transcripts that fuse to each other um, through the primers. So this will be removed in ISO 3, three refined steps. It will also trim away poly A tail if your transcript has poly A tail. Finally, the ISO 6 three cluster steps will cluster the, the reads into groups of transcripts, groups of isoforms, for further downstream analysis. I'll now go through this in a little bit more details and with a graphical visualization of what 
each step of ISO 6 is actually doing. So as you can see, the first step is to actually demultiplex. And I have shown here the example command line on how to actually do this with a tool called Lima. Lima is our tool that is used to actually demultiplex barcodes, but since the, the process of removing barcodes is actually similar to removing primers, it is also used to actually remove primers, but with a special ISO sig mode. Some other parameters such as dump clips will actually tell you for each of the reads what is actually the uh, primers sequence that has been clipped. Peak guess would help you to remove some of the spurious false positive signals by taking a random set of reads in the beginning and try to actually infer what are the barcodes used. If you have sample barcodes attached, you will also provide um, the primer sequence together with the barcode sequence in the FASTA file used for this particular part, which is isosic primers of FASTA file. For this sample, which is the Alzheimer's brain sample, we did not multiplex the sample. So you, so you will, inside the primers, Fast A file is actually just the primers used for our ISO Express protocol. Dash J24 here refers to the number of threads to use. So ISO can actually utilize parallelization to speed up the analysis. After completion, you will see the following files, which is um, the band file after removing the primers, which is in bold, in band file, in the index file, as well as the XML file. Note that there is also a set of Lima reports generated. This will be useful, for example, to actually troubleshoot um, in the case of why your, um, the final set of uh, demultiplex file is actually uh, not as good as you expected. So in some cases, for example, TSOs, um, so in some, we have seen in the field, some customers actually forgot to add TSO, for example, and some of these um, library artifacts will actually show up in the Lima reports as well. If your data quality is not good, the conversion rate will actually be low and that can be seen in the Lima file as well. So the Lima reports file are useful if you need to troubleshoot your experiments. Otherwise, you will actually take the band file directly into the next step. The next step is to actually uh, carry out ISO 3 refine. Just to go back a little, if you notice on the left here, on the picture in the primary removal steps, the first transcripts in this picture actually looks a bit strange because you can actually see the primers in the middle, okay, which is the yellow color here. This is what we call a concatenar, and it's actually a library artifacts that will be removed in the ISO 3 refine steps. So in the ISO 3 refine steps, this is how you actually run it by typing ISO 3 refine followed by double dash require poly A if your transcript says poly A tails, which is what you want most of the time using the input from the previous step, which is the BAM file after demultiplexing, you will still need to give it the primers fast A file. And this is really for removing the concatenar. As you can see, it detects primers file in the middle of sequence and actually remove uh, artifacts, concatenar artifacts. The output file from this step is actually called flnc.bam. flnc stands for full length non-concatenar. So the first step, which is to remove the primers, already tells you that the reads are full-length because you have both the five prime and three prime primers. And this particular step, after removing the concatenars, it adds an NC to the naming, as you can see. So it stands for full-length non concatenar There are other reports, files um, from ISO refined reports, such as the filter summary.json file, as well as the report.csv. The report.csv, for example, will tell you how long the poly A tail is for each of these transcripts and how long the transcripts are after concatenar removals. The filter.summary JSON file is a very high level reports file that tells you, for example, how many of your reads are actually full length non concatenar from the original set of reads. The next step is to actually cluster the full length non concatenar band file by taking the output from the previous steps and cluster them with a, sim a command, ISO 3 cluster. There is two extra parameters that, that we have put here, as you can see. The first one is double dash verbals, which, which is um, to actually uh, provide more output information. 
And the other one is actually um, double dash use QVs. So if you are using CCS reads, ISO 63 cluster will actually use the per base QV information to improve the um, clustering process. And this step is really to take um, the input full length non concatenable reads and splits them into different clusters of isoforms. As you can see on the visualization on the left here, we have four clusters from the full length non concatenable reads file, and they have different splice patterns. The blue one being um, one uh, types of uh, genes, and then the gray one being another one. And the final steps of this is that you will generate a cluster report that tells you, um, for example, what which read has been used to generate a, uh, used to support a single cluster. And two sets of files. One is for high quality HQ. The other one is called low quality LQ. HQ stands for isoforms that has more than ninety nine percent predicted accuracy, and has more than two supports, um, two FL and full length non concatenable reads that supports them. The LQ read stands for low quality reads isoforms that has predicted accuracy of less than 99% um, accuracy, but they still have more than, full, more than two full length on categories to support them. Now, most of the time, if your read data is of high quality, you should expect most of the isoforms to be of HQ. As you can see from an example just now where we align the isoforms to um, the genome, we can see that the transcripts identity should be more than 99% most of the time. Take note here, compared to a very um, old workflow where we had uh, uh, isocic polish steps, because we now actually use um, CCS band file as an input, the reads are already polished. So there is no longer a need to actually polish the um, clusters with sub reads, um, which was actually one of the steps that was done. If you were using ISO SIG from a long time ago. So that step is now um, not required because the reads are already of very high quality and it actually saves you a lot of computational time without the polishing step. The next, so what I have just gone through with you is actually what um, can be done with the uh, command line ISO SIG command. We now introduce a, a new command, which is using PBMM2. It's actually an alignment tool by, um, adopt, adopted by CrackBio using Minimac2 as a base. PBMM2 allows you to align your transcripts uh, band file, which is the polished high quality transcripts band file to a known, to a reference genome. So here is an example of a human, so we will map it to the HG38 genome to generate a set of aligned transcripts file. If you are trying to align SOSIC files, take note that you have to actually tell PBMM2 that this is an isosig file by giving it double dash preset isosig. The sort command will actually sort the output band files and the log level command will give you uh, some progress information in the log file. Again, this step can be parallelized by giving it the dash J 24 parameters, which is for example, here it will use 24 CPU threads. The purpose of mapping is to, is to actually generate this set of aligned band files that you can actually use for collapsing redundant transcripts. So isosig3 also comes with a command called isosig3 collapse that will take the aligned band files from the previous PBMM2 steps and generate a set of non-redundant collapsed transcripts in the form of a GFF file. GFF format is a standard format that can be used for many downstream applications um, for a genome annotation. After you run the collapse, ISO 63 collapse step, you will see this set of file, including the report stats and list as usual, and a two final set of file, which is in GFF file and FASTA file. The FASTA file contain, contains one um, sequence for one um, unique non-redundant transcripts. So if you go into the GFF file, it doesn't contain a sequence, but you can actually take the isoforms ID and look for the sequence in the fast A file essentially. And these two are, mo are most of the time what you need for further downstream analysis, such as quantity three. You can also visualize these transcripts as IGB by directly um, 
loading the GFF file into IGB. So the GFF file, form, file provided by isosic 3 Collapse can be loaded into IGB to visualize transcript splicing format for a gene that you're interested in. And just to final, finalize what I have just gone through with you just now, some of the terminology. Full-length read stands for F. FL read stands for full-length reads, which is CCS reads with 5' and 2' cDNA primers. To recap, this is basically the first step where we actually remove the primers using Lima. Full-length non-concatible reads refers to um, the full-length reads that has both the poly-A tails and concatenables removed. And again, to recap, this is basically the isosic 3 refine steps. And finally, the purpose of isosic analysis is to generate a set of high quality isoforms and a set of low quality isoforms, referring to HQ and LQ isoforms. As you can see, that both of them need to have more than two full length non concatenable reads to support, with the difference being HQ stands for predicted accuracy of more than 99%, and LQ stands for predicted accuracy of less than 99%. And majority of the isoforms generated from isosic. Um, library should be of high quality isoforms. So that was um, the workflow for going through um, a standard isosic analysis um, workflow. So as you may know, PacBio also pro, um, has a, a recommended protocol to actually do a single cell isosic analysis. And this is a very new um, field that we are all very excited about. So single cell is not a new thing anymore, but majority of the single cell analysis is done based using conventional RNA-seq. And as you can see, the caveat that applies to RNA-seq is the same as that of bulk sequencing, whereby it is very hard to actually categorize isoforms and alternative splicing patterns. With single cell isosic analysis, you basically take the single cell library prepared with any platforms and run it through a smart sequencing which will allow you to actually categorize full-length isoforms in single cells. And why is this very exciting is that you can now actually look at um, cell type specific mRNA splicing patterns that is not captured with short reads RNA sequencing. With full-length RNA sequencing, you will be able to actually categorize all these alternative splicing patterns and the very high accuracy of hi fi reads allows you to categorize these alternative splicing patterns with very high confidence. And one of the very um, important things in single cell sequencing is that you actually need to um, categorize the UMIs and barcodes. So you need to be able to identify the unique molecular index as well as the barcodes for you to reduce um, redundant molecules and to actually um, to actually link the transcripts back to specific cells. And this requires very accurate reads because the UMIs and, and barcodes are actually um, not very different from each other. And so you actually need very high accuracy to identify them. Shown here is an example of um, a, a sample that has been sequenced both with PacBio as isosync as well as with Illumina sequencing. And when we rank the, the barcodes that has, um, that based on the number of uh, UMIs contains in barcodes, we can see that the barcodes ranking for uh, different cells correlates very well between Illumina and PacBio. So this tells you that um, our capability to actually identify barcodes are actually as accurate as short reads data. Shown here on the right, is an example of a um, transcript length distribution for single cell RNA sequencing. For single cell RNA sequencing, the transcript lengths typically range from one to two kb for uh, human samples. Shown here is an example of multiple isosic publications that has came up, um, come out in the past few years. There are of course more papers that is not um, listed here that has been published recently as well. And I will encourage you to do a quick search on Google just to see um, how uh, this method has been getting more popular in the recent years. Um, a very exciting recent preprint that has come out is um, a paper called Mass Isosync. In the traditional single cell isosync sequencing, one of the main issues is that the throughput for each 
uh, smart cell, while it is reasonably high at about three to four million uh, full length reads, it's still uh, on the on a little lower side because you are trying to categorize many many cells, right? So the throughput has been an issue in the past. With this recent preprint called I Mass Isosic by a group from Broad Institute, they will try. They actually developed this new method that tries to concatenate multiple isoforms into a single molecule before sequencing with PacBio. And this works very well because generally transcripts are not that long. And so with PacBio sequencing, you are actually um, getting a very uh, in, uh, incredible amount of passes if it is only one to two KB, right? So if you now concatenate these um, isoforms into what looks like a WGS um, libraries, in terms of the insert length, you can actually sequence multiple transcripts in lesser passes, but still, re still um, enough pass to actually obtain what we call high fire reads, which is 99.9% .9 accuracy. So the author concatenated um, 10 to 15 transcripts into a single, sorry, a single transcript and actually single molecules and sequenced them in packed biosequencing. And this resulted in an increase of 15 fold which is close to 40 million cDNA reads for one smart cell AM. This resulted in more than 34 boosted discovery of differentially spliced genes and provided robust cell type clusterings all without using short reads data. In the past, it is typically very common to actually incorporate short read sequencing data to increase the throughput of isosync, but with this method, the author was able to demonstrate that with just long reads, you can actually um, generate very robust cell tech class screen in addition to the benefits of categorizing uh, splice patterns much better. Our ISOC protocol, uh, our single cell ISOC um, library protocol can be found on our website. And we are compatible with any single cell platform that generates full length cDNA. Shown here is an example of on the left is about RNA seq on packed biosystem where we have to prepare the library starting from RNA. But if you prepare any single cell like full length cDNA library with other platforms, you can directly put um, generate a ligated smart bell and sequence it with packed bios sequencing. And shown on the bottom is the um, visualization of how the molecules look like in bulk sequencing, as well as the single cell sequencing. As you can see, the major, the major difference is the cell barcodes and URMI. And it depends on whether you are using the Fire Prime Capture Kit or the Creep Prime Capture Kit. For bioinformatics workflow with single cell isosync, we provide a set of recommendations that you can look at on um, the Cupcake GitHub page. Here, I will just summarize the um, quick steps, starting from high fi reads of Fire Prime Primer, transcripts, polyatails, UMI cell barcodes, followed by uh, ending with three prime primers. We will, we will use Lima to actually remove the CNA primers. So this is very similar to what you do for bulk RNA sequencing as well. And then we will extract the UMI and barcodes with a tool in um, isoSeq to actually deduplicate the UMI. So this tool is actually um, provided by the isoSeq tool as well. Finally, we will cluster by UMI after collapsing the UMI. So for every, U, for, um, every molecule, we will collapse the UMI if it comes, because it means that they come from, came from the same molecule. And after collapsing, we will then cluster each of these molecules um, into different isoforms. So this step, again, is very similar to the box sequencing um, protocol, where you actually cluster by high fire reads. So instead of clustering by high fire reads, you cluster UMI, which is basically deduplicated high fi reads. Finally, you can, you can use Squanty to actually carry out quality control as well, if you have a reference transcriptomes as well as reference genome. So this was used in the bulk isosic protocol, but you can actually use it for single cell sequencing as well. And we highly encourage you to use it because it actually uh, provides a lot, a lot of very useful information as mentioned, for example, whether the transcripts are novel or not. And it had also has a function to actually filter some of the artifacts, such as reverse transcript-based artifacts, as well as interprime, intra-priming artifacts. 
shown here is an example of um, squat D3 filtering in a single cell iso um, sequencing examples. So on the left here, you can see that before filtering, um, there is about 56% of transcripts that has been categorized as full splice match. After squat D3 filtering, because it actually removes many of the genic, genomic um, and intergenic transcripts, the relative proportion of full splice match will actually increase. So this would tell this um, basically tells you that um, squat T3 is actually doing a pretty good job of filtering out the transcripts that's not important and keep only those transcripts that's important. That's actually non-artifacts as well. <clears throat> the final output of uh, isoSeq will actually give you a, a file that contains um, annotation for each of the molecule by linking them to transcripts at genes if you are using with them with Squanty. So for each of the molecule, you can see that, for example, this molecule, this is the um, ENCODE transcripts name as well as the um, ensemble gene name. The category is uh, from Squanty tree again. So this will tell you that this is a full splice match um, molecule transcripts. And it will also tell you what is the UMI and barcodes. You can take this file and generate a, a matrix of transcripts against cell. So this will tell you what is the count for each transcripts in each cell. So this can be readily generated with simple scripts as well. And this file is typically what is then used in downstream analysis tools, such as single cell clustering, as well as um, other functions, such as functional annotation. Again, you can go to our isoSeq.how page to look at um, some of the recommendations for single cell isoSeq bioinformatics workflow. I have, I have put here the URL here, which is isoSeq.how slash UMI. It basically goes through with you the UMI and barcode streaming process as well as the deduplication process. To summarize single cell isoSeq, it is compatible with any full-length single cell platforms. We provide a detailed workflow guidance on our website in terms in, in the um, form of procedures and checklists. It uses standard isoSeq library preparation and sequencing workflow, so it is very simple. You can generate matching shortlist data from the same sample if you want to, um, for example, carry out quantification by increasing the throughputs. One smart cell AM allows you to generate about 3 million hi-fi reads. And we also provide flexible barcoding and multiplexing based on the desired number of reads per cell. That's all I have for the um, isoSeq uh, workflow, both for single cell and stand, um, standard bulk sequencing. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you, keep in. Uh, that was an excellent talk. Thank you so much. Um, so we'll just have some time for some uh, a few questions. Um, uh, Apologies if you had raised your hand in the last session, I wasn't checking, but if you are raising, want to, do want to raise your hand, ask a question directly, um, you can do so now. Um, there's been some questions in the chat which we might sort of uh, briefly touch on. Um, I know Liz has answered them uh, uh, already, but just so everyone else is sort of in the loop. Um, uh, there's a question about what if you want to cluster your isoforms per gene? Um, how do you do that? What, what sort of uh, recommendations if, you, if you're trying to focus on a specific gene and look at the different isoforms there? Yeah, so um, essentially that is um, the steps where you actually um, use PBMM2 to align the transcripts back to the genome. So if you have a reference genome, that will be what you do um, by directly mapping the transcripts. And then you can um, you know, load that up on IGV and then just visualize the alternative splicing patterns. Or you can, of course, um, uh, write some scripts to actually process the data as well, to extract the relevant genes and to look at the um, splice junction by taking the output of the mapping map um, and collapse isoforms essentially. Um, if you don't have a reference genome, um, you can use a tool called Cogent, which Lise will talk about, that will actually attempt to reconstruct the coding, um, coding region of the genome without using any reference genome. And then um, by using that reconstructed um, genome, you can then map the reads back 
onto it and then try to uh, visualize the alternate splicing patterns. So that will be what Liz will talk about later on. All right, excellent. Um, I have another question for you. You really piqued my interest with the, uh, the mass ISIS where you're concatenating um, your transcripts. Uh, I imagine you'd need special software to split them out at the end after you've generated your um, sequencing. Yes, indeed. So, um, so the, uh, the, the, the preprint from uh, Broad Institute actually talked about it. So they actually developed a tool called Longbow that will actually um, use a um, statistical model to actually look at topology of the reads and try to, and try to split them up depending on how many, um, how many transcripts you try to concatenate in the sequencing. And it will actually split them up into the individual um, molecule. And that, that is how they actually um, in increase the throughput. Yeah, pretty impressive. Um, we've got a new question just coming in. Uh, for de novo genome annotation, which file to use for annotation tra training? The CCS FASTA or the cluster HQ BAM file? Training. Training of like what, like Augustus or Breaker? I think maybe uh, if I, we could kind of table that question for after I talk about my the, the publications and then maybe um, Izu, you would have some sense of, you know, yeah. clarification. Um, just one last question, um, just around the compute requirements for some of these tools, are they very compute intensive? Um, what's, what sort of uh, hardware do you need to have available to do this type of analysis? Yeah, so that does depends on the amount of data that you generate, but generally speaking, as you can see in the examples that I've shown, uh, most of the commands use about 24 CPUs. And that is usually enough for uh, because we are actually using CCS um, BAM file, which is a uh, much smaller data footprint than says, for example, subread spam file. So they are not that computational uh, expensive. Um, so, you know, mo most, of, most of the um, compute server should be able to handle it um, pretty well. But of course that, that might change if you have, you know, like a lot of data, you know, data. generally for one, Smart cell, um, it's not that competition and expensive. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, we might move on to our next speaker. Now, uh, I've been told that um, our next speaker, Gareth, um, wasn't able to, to make um, this meeting, but he has prepared um, a uh, presentation anyway that we've recorded. Um, so I'll just introduce him and um, we'll play that recording for you. Um, so Gareth Price is the head of computational biology at QCIF, facility for advanced bioinformatics. Gareth has 20 years experience um, as a biomedician and genomic scientist. His expertise spans experimental design, assay performance, data QC, data analysis, and data interpretation involving a variety of model organisms from microorganisms, fruit flies, mice to humans, as well as non-model organisms with li limited genome information. Gareth is also the service manager for Galaxy Australia. Um, and today I'll be talking about Biocommons and the Galaxy resources that are available um, to be applied to genome annotation. So we'll play that, um, play his video. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to present today. I apologize, I can't present today in person as I did for last week, uh, but I'm hoping I can deliver uh, just as relevant presentation today as I did then. By way of introduction, I'm Gareth Price. Uh, I work at QCIF Bioinformatics and one of the hats I wear is Service Manager, Manager of Galaxy Australia. And I'm here today to tell you about Galaxy Australia and the larger environment it works in, which is the Australian Biocommons. So starting with the Australian Biocommons, their mission is to enhance Australia's digital life science research through world-class collaborative dis distributed infrastructure. And they can be found at, at biocommons.org.au. Who are they and what do they do? Well, they run currently a number of services that I'm focusing on. They also have an important role in training and community engagement, which I'll touch on. The current services delivered under the Biocommons umbrella and through their many partner organizations include the Bioplatforms Australia Data Portal, a wonderful tool finder and workflow finder that allows you to find bioinformatics tools, but really bioinformatics tools that 
have been deployed on Australian e-research infrastructure, including sites like NCI, Pawsey, Chris Cloud, and UQ and Galaxy Australia. One of the services of Biocommons is Galaxy Australia, and obviously I'm going to talk more about that shortly. And the last service I want to mention, uh, but certainly not the least, is the recently launched Australian Apollo service, which is a web accessible platform that allows you to conduct collaborative uh, curation and editing of genome annotations, a service that we're seeing is more and more critically important for not only generating your genome, but adding value to it, either generating it via long reads or adding value to it through, say, ISOSeq and uh, well-documented genic structure that comes from ISOSeq data. We're going to skip through a couple of the uh, Biocommons offerings and the first one is the data portal where you can access some of this primary data uh, with authorization to just a number of the species I've listed here. There's many more initiatives uh, beyond the three here and they're found at data at bioplatforms.com. Tool and workflow finders I've shared on one slide, mainly because they are found uh, both at the same repository listed at the bottom there on GitHub. And these are some wonderful resource for finding uh, what tools you have, all hyperlinked, well described, with EDEM ontologies to uh, showcase the domain of practice they're used in, tool versions, and deployment sites with our, around the country. And the Apollo service that I mentioned just before at apollo-portal.genome.edu.au is this collaborative platform for loading in all slew of evidence files that allow you to better describe your genome, annotate it, and in a wonderful collaborative and sharing manner where you can control who can see it, who can edit it, who can authorize changes uh, again. If you're interested, click on sign up, see if this is relevant for your research and how we can offer this uh, collectively to you through the BioCommons. I did mention briefly uh, that the BioCommons offers training. They do regularly training events and webinars. All of that content can be found on YouTube. I won't suggest you memorize the YouTube URL, but rather simply Google Australian BioCommons and you'll find a lot of talks there, uh, wonderful content on describing how to do uh, e-research within Australia. And the partners, huge number of partners for Biocommons, uh, all manner of national research infrastructure, institutional sites and overseas collaborations that allow us to deliver the content that uh, we know is relevant to Australian researchers. For me, the primary content that I look at this point in time to deliver uh, through QCIF and through the BioCommons is Galaxy Australia, which is a web hosted accessible platform that allows you to conduct accessible, reproducible and transparent computational biological research. How does it do this? Well, at its uh, surface, it's a website. Behind its uh, sophisticated infrastructure, of distributed computer around the country, which I will showcase that allows you to run, pardon me, uh, over one and a half thousand tools we have listed on the website on any manner of data that you upload in the most economical and efficient manner to you and to the infrastructure. So I'll take a step back uh, before I describe the service in detail. It's been in operation since uh, 2018, formally as a national service. It did grow from pockets of regional funding to be funded, supported and championed uh, as the national service for mature life science analytics. We do uh, at a high level observe the kind of practices our users do and what we've been seeing in the last 12 to 18 months is they're running increasingly larger jobs and a desire to run more concurrent jobs. The range of tools that has been accessed by users is going up and then by extension, the number of workflows and the diversity of workflows they're running is going up as well. We know our users uh, want more reference data sets and using more reference data sets and also that they're moving a lot more data in and out of the surface service. 
which you know stands to reason, particularly uh, in the transition from short read sequencing to uh, long read sequencing. So what we've done in response, well, we've deployed uh, larger and larger compute resources, most recently at NCI and PAUSI. Uh, we have brought online high memory dedicated nodes for processing of demanding data, which can include genome assembly, uh, genome annotation, uh, de novo transcript assembly, again, targeted again towards something like ISOSeq, metagenomics, and the list goes on. We have brought on a training as an infrastructure service or a TS service. And through the Australian Biocommons, we are engaging specifically with communities of practice, both biological and technological, uh, to make sure that the platforms that we make available are as relevant as ever. Uh, what does all this mean in terms of less statements and more actual facts? Well, it means that we've seen uh, our user growth trend upwards, certainly only showing the last two years here, and concurrent to our user number growth is the job growth has continued to grow. And rather satisfyingly, and as a simple uh, line in the sand, February last year, we passed our first millionth job, February this year, our second millionth, and in, in far less than a full year, our third millionth was passed in just this September, and we're on track for a short fourth million as well. I did mention that data in and out, and this is one of the challenges all researchers face, is moving data from their institutional machines to a place to analyze, back to their long-term storage, etc. And uh, recognizing this, Galaxy worked with Arnet, our Australian research network, that does provide up to a terabyte of storage uh, for free to the researcher on their cloud store offerings. So the Galaxy team spent some time and built functionality into Galaxy uh, for the import of data, shown here on the left-hand side of the screen, where through a simple configuration of your Galaxy account, you can expose via high security your cloud store uh, service to Galaxy and ingest files. And by extension, through this same mechanism, you can expose uh, Cloud Store to Galaxy for the movement of files back out of Galaxy for long-term storage on Cloud Store. I did say behind the website, Galaxy is supported by a sophisticated infrastructure and distributed network of compute. Here is what it looks like. So we have uh, currently uh, distributed compute at Pawsey in WA, we have multiple computes deployed through Victoria, through, thanks to the University of Melbourne and Arnett. Uh, we have deployments at NCI in the Australian Capital Territory and through uh, joint support at UQ and QCIF, we have more machines. Where your job runs is a combination of uh, all of these locations. And that's best summarized by one of our more recent features, a feature we're very proud of actually, uh, written for Galaxy Australia and now pushed out to the global Galaxy community uh, for operation on other Galaxy services. And this is our total perspective vortex, which is a meta scheduler. This works by taking account of all the dynamic use of that infrastructure around the country, the type of job a user wants to run, the size of the data providing, the user identity, the ability for that job to run, run close or remote to the, the web service, and um, quite frankly, a number of other business rules that I don't have time to go into now. And this meta scheduler or TPV allows us to distribute user files and user demands around the country in the most efficient way possible. And really, that's great for us, but what does it mean for the user? It means for the user that when they execute a job, their queue time is as minimal as possible, the job is resourced uh, as maximally as possible, and those combination of events means they get their data back as quick as possible. What does that actually mean in real life? Well, what it means is we're enabling rapid research. So this is actually a real use case I'm showing here on the screen. I've summarized it down just to keep the identity of some of the collaborative partners uh, opaque. 
So using those new high memory machines we've got available, which are fast CPU, high amount of RAM, and very fast very write local storage, uh, we took on board a number of genome assembly projects. In Galaxy, this is represented graphically as a workflow that where we ingest data into Galaxy, we convert the file format. And by the way, I should mention this is PacBio Hi-Fi reads that we're working with here. We run Hi-Fi ASM and an entire slew of uh, post-assembly QC and visualization to reach our end result. And in our case, we were very satisfied with a, a high end 50, a reasonable number of contigs, and a, importantly for us, a total length that recapitulated the species in question, or at least in this case, this is the first time it was sequenced, a closely related species. And what was great is using our, these high memory nodes, we achieved this entire assembly in less than two hours of compute time. Providing for the user, and that's it for the researcher, a really quick feedback on the analytical journey they're taking, allowing them potentially to iterate through multiple versions of that genome assembly and not have to wait overnight or days for that result to come back to them. And now that I've uh, somewhat established maybe Galaxy's credentials for, for using PacBio data in, in genome assembly, it's time to turn to ISOSeq. And I've got to be honest, we're not there yet. And we're not there yet because we haven't turned those uh, amazing tools for ISOSeq that are available through PacBio and, and their GitHub repositories into functional tools that are available on Galaxy. So what I wanted to highlight here is, well, how does Galaxy deal with onboarding that new information? The first answer is through you, uh, the researcher. Come to us and write to us and say, I want this tool on the service. That is one of the most productive ways we find out about what users want to do and the kinds of data they process. So request at usegalaxy.org.au will take you to a relatively simple to fill out uh, Google form that will tell us about what you need to run on our service and we will do our best efforts to make it available. And one of the places that you can go to learn about uh, what can be run on the Galaxy is off to Penn State Uni where the Global Galaxy Toolshed is hosted. As of uh, approximately a week and a half ago, there are just shy of 8,500 tools that Galaxy can utilize and you can utilize to do your research. So again, the combination of these two will get you a fantastic tool set on Galaxy. And one of those tool sets we look forward to growing is, is ISOSeq uh, data analysis options. We do have classic tools like Minimap, but uh, we're expanding the set of uh, ICC tools. If you want to know more about the style of work you can do on Galaxy, then the Galaxy Training Network is a fantastic place to go. Uh, the Training Network is best discovered by Google by simply Googling Training at Galaxy Project. Uh, and you'll find nearly 200 tutorials uh, there both biological tutorials here on the left and operational tutorials on the right. I've simply chosen to highlight down here that there are 24 complex tutorials already sitting in the gene expression slash RNA seq slash single cell RNA seq space. And we look forward again to growing that with more ISO seq options. And when you want to do that training, uh, I mentioned this earlier on. Uh, one of our roles nationally is to upskill Australian researchers in how to do their bioinformatics training. And to that, uh, we have enabled inside Galaxy a priority training queue, which is the training infrastructure as a service. So on any given day, Galaxy has its standard users making all sorts of standard and diverse demands on the service. And when a workshop comes online, we don't necessarily want those workshop participants to be competing with our standard users for compute infrastructure. So the TIA service, which please, if you're interested, do write to us and ask us about, allows workshop participants to have their own dedicated queue, their own dedicated infrastructure for high priority access and quick turnaround time during training events. 
as a trainer, and in particularly in this diverse uh, post-COVID world of online events, you also get uh, a complete dashboard of user interaction and user progress through tools which can really allow you to manage your training events. And just as I uh, start to close up my presentation, uh, Galaxy also offers uh, interactive tool environments. Uh, these range from uh, fantastic ones like BAM.io and DCF.io for visualizing your complex data, Finch for metagenomics analysis, ecology platforms, as well as your core sort of notebooks, Jupyter Notebook and RStudio environments. This allows you to just take your analysis potentially just beyond the tool offerings in Galaxy and give you a really complex and rich environment to do your data analysis. So in summary, Galaxy is supported by that global tool shed of over 8,000 analytical tools. It has been globally in operation for over 15 years and relies on uh, the generous support and engagement of a community of practitioners that numbers into the hundreds that develop code and tools all year long. I didn't really get a chance to highlight, but it does have that rich workflow environment to build, uh, nest and report on complex workflows. Uh, it also supports rich metadata and uh, from a computational point of view, particularly again, coming back to ISOSeq, uh, and the mapping of data to a genome. Uh, Galaxy pre-supports hundreds of genomes. They're pre-indexed uh, for rapid analysis. So again, makes the service ever more efficient for you, the researcher. So in our not so humble opinion, we see Galaxy as a critical digital research infrastructure for Australian life sciences and well fitted into the global Galaxy community. And that's maybe no better summarised in two recent Nature publications from the last couple of months that uh, in Nature Biotech and Nature Methods that cite the activity of Galaxy Australia in Nature Biotech and more globally in Nature Methods where Galaxy, the platform fits in amongst various workflow managers. Both cases, Galaxy come out well. So with that, please do come and use us. We're at usegalaxy.org.au. You'll find all the contact details for our team on that website. And we look forward to seeing you analyze your data on our service. And I'd like to thank the ever-growing Galaxy Australia team for de deploying, delivering, and maintaining this service for our Australian clientele and all our partners, funding, research, and infrastructure partners that allow us to deliver this service to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gareth. Um, I'm not sure we, I don't think we can ask any questions for Gareth, um, being uh, just a video. So I think we'll uh, move on then to our, our final speaker today, um, who is uh, Elizabeth uh, Sang. Um, Elizabeth completed her PhD at the University of Washington, working on the computational discovery of bacterial non-coding RNAs through large-scale genomic clustering. She's worked for PacBio for over nine years, beginning as a senior bioinformatics scientist, where she developed a prototype algorithm for ISOSeq, and has continued to work on ISOSeq in terms of software integration, as well as demonstrating the use of ISOSeq for genome annotation and human disease. She's now Associate Director of Product Marketing Bioinformatics, where she works on not on methods and application development for PacBio long read sequencing applied to transcriptome sequencing, SARS-CoV-2 sequencing, and other emerging applications. So I'm very excited to hear Liz's talk titled Stories of Genome Annotation Using the ISOSeq Method. Thank you. And I'm trying to turn off this ding that's happening with my text message and I'm failing. So I'm sorry if, if you hear more dings. I literally don't know how to make my phone stop doing that. And do I have 20 minutes, 30 minutes? What do I have? Um, you have, yeah, you, you have a half an hour if you need it. No worries. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. So um, I'm going to talk, hopefully, in a more relaxed manner about a few... I would say success stories of using ISOSeq for genome annotation. 
And just like how every story is supposed to be, um, you know, listened to and absorbed, the goal of the story is not that, you know, to understand, oh, I don't, I need to also turn off the timing. Let's just see, how do I do that? Okay. All right, so just like every story, um, the hopefully what you'll get out of it is not so much all the details but rather inspire you to think about how people have been using isoseq for different purposes and you know ask me any questions either online or, or or after this that like what can you learn from these different publications that might apply to your research so keeping already talked about the informatic solution which i will not go into detail but it kind of matters to understand kind of the high level list of tools that people use and the purpose of these tools not so much the actual tools since we we'll actually see that you know there are some tools that can be swapped out so for example tama is a, is an alternative to cupcake so you'll see that some tools choose some papers choose to use tama and not cupcake and some of them use Sconti, and some of the other ones use Talon versus um, Swan. Keeping also walk you through this, so I'm gonna skip this. So I wanna start with a tale of four species. The first one is Arabidopsis. So in this preprint, what they have done is do a very complete overhaul of the Arabidopsis annotation using ISOSeq. And I find it fascinating because I find I thought Arabidas is one of those genome annotations that should be sequenced to death. And yet it turns out that when you have long read data, things can look quite different. I'm showing you the schematic of what they've done here. The point, again, is not to show, to go through every, each of these flowcharts, but rather just to see a high level how people structure their genome annotation framework. The blue section is what Keeping has covered, and I would say is probably rather standard, is that almost any ISOC paper you'll see probably starts with all of these. They begin to diverge after the blue parts, you know, how do you do the collapsing after you match to the genome? How do you actually do the annotation of the splice junctions and the transcription start site and end sites? These are the parts where people will start to have very specific needs and because of the way their genomes and their species are, they may choose different tools. Just for this data set, what they have found is that not only they can identify protein coding genes, 30,000 of them, but they can also find non-protein coding genes. And just an example of how the annotation is improved, if we start from the bottom, the black is the original Arabidopsis annotation, the red is the second generation of the Arabidopsis annotation, and the blue one is the one that includes the ISOSeq data. And immediately you can see, first of all, there's an explosion of the number of isoforms. There's also interim retention, so marked here by IR. There is um, alternative end sites that were annotated before, but were never shown in this much diversity. So in the next two slides, I, actually next three slides, I want to walk you through two vignettes from this paper. The first one is a thymine synthesis gene. THIC gene in Rabidopsis. Um, and the, if you look at the annotation of the blue one, the same story emerges is that the isoseq annotation identifies way more diversity than the previous annotations. The one that's most interesting is if you look at this is the 3 prom M, there's a new set of 3 prom UTRs that's much shorter. So you can see that it ends around here, of which 0.28 is the name of one of those isoforms is the most dominant. And if you look at the red one, which is the previous annotation, none of the isoforms had annotated this 3 prime UTR. Now, this might not matter, except that they've actually shown that during cold stress, so here we're seeing the time point series of this data set where the dashed blue line is where the cold stress happens, and then these different wiggly lines show the isoform expressions based on the previous version of annotation. So we're looking at the version two of annotation. 
So if you look at it, it seems like there's three isoforms, 0.3, P1 and P2, that are alternate, that are switching and fluctuating over time, whereas all the other isoforms don't seem to move much. But that's based on the old annotation right here. If you look at the new annotation and what that would look like, the story looks very different. In fact, the dominant 0.28 isoform is almost solely responsible for the expression level changes during cold stress. If you then look at a different gene, uh, the opposite story uh, sort of emerges. So this CIPK gene has only four anno isoforms annotated in the previous annotation. It has 10 isoforms in the first, um, in the new uh, version three of annotation. And of interest is these three isoforms, 0.13 and 6. And they're interesting because they're actually identical except for the transcription start size and the end sites being different lengths. And if you're wondering how can you be so sure about the transcription start size and end sites, that is almost the gist of this entire preprint is going to excruciating lengths to say I am confident that these are three distinct isoforms with different starts and end sites. If we look at the old annotation, you'd see that there seems to be only one isoform that is fluctuating due to cold stress. But if we then look at the new annotation, the story changes. The total expression, which is the pink line, looks the same. But underneath, it's different now. So 0.3 and 0.6 are the two higher level ones. And you can see that they, they have this like rhythm of pattern with, that doesn't seem to be really changing with respect to the cold stress. But the lower one, this green one, 0.1, the one with the shortest transcription starts at an end site, actually is not expressed before the cold stress and is brought on to be cold induced. So that is the first story. We'll now move on to the second story, uh, the California coastal redwood. So two years ago, we at PacBio actually went and collected a redwood tree uh, on the Stanford campus and did PacBio sequencing. This is not that story, that story has already been told. A year later, we went back and from the same tree retrieved uh, RNA samples from the same tree, the needle samples, and then we produced redwood isoseq data. Here's a distribution of the statistics. It follows what we see in most of our isoseq samples. We can see all the way up to 10 kilobases of full-length transcripts. We can also see high isoform diversity shown in this pink histogram. I want to show you some of the screenshots from this data set. So first, why do we care about isoforms? Not only do we care that their expression changes um, that are at the isoform level, but a lot of times these isoform levels actually drive open reading frame changes. Right, so here's an example. There are three isoforms here, 0.1 and 0.2. Um, if you know how to read GFF files, the thick, there's a little bit of thickness from here to here. That indicates the coding region of this isoform. So the first two isoforms are not any different in terms of the predicted open reading frame. They're only different in the 3' UTR. And if I show you down here the predicted amino acid sequence, they're identical. If I then look at the third isoform, which uses an alternative 3' end, you can see that, of course, the open reading frame changes. Another interesting um, sort of challenge that the Redwood brought about was that this was a hexaploid. So prior to the Redwood data set, I had worked with some collaborators on using IsoSeq to do haplotype phasing for the isoform data. We had applied it back then to maize data. And because it's maize, we not only had the, the, the F1 hybrids, but we also had the parental data. Now, the tool that we develop, isophase, does not require parental data, but it is useful to have parental data for purpose of validation and assigning the alleles back to whether it's maternal or paternal. Again, importantly, why do we care about phasing for isoforms? It is because that we might be able to see the coding consequences of these changes. 
what was not even clear to me when I had analyzed the redwood data is whether something like isophase would work on a hexaploid uh, transcriptome. So here I'm showing you the IGV screenshots of um, the isoseq transcripts. So right now I'm not showing you any uh, phasing information. Then when I applied isophase, we were actually able to phase it based on the SNPs present in the transcribed regions into five alleles. So there's one, two, three, four, five colored differently here. And the ones that have a bit more squiggly bars are the ones where the SNPs are. So if you're wondering, this is a hexaploid, why are there only five groups? Well, that's because not all of the SNPs are in the transcribed regions. And so if we went back and looked at the genome haplotigs, this is actually the PAC bio data. Uh, these are the haplotigs generated from the hi fi ASM assembly. We can see that actually based on the SNPs that are present in the transcribed regions, there are only five distinct alleles. This data set is now public. If you're wondering, have I annotated this genome based on the ISO-seq data? I have not, so I'm putting this data out here. I would love if somebody would like to take over. So the next story is a jellyfish. The Tina for Pack Bio Genome and Annotation. And I encourage you to um, click on this Twitter link. I'll share the slides with you later because it's quite fascinating. I had no idea what Tina fours were, but now I realize that one of the first groups of animals to branch off and understanding their transcriptome and genome has really important kind of biological implications in evolution. Now, what I really like this paper is it went through just like the previous papers in Arabidopsis, excruciating detail in the manuscript about how the gene, genes were manually curated. So just high level, what they used was a combination of Breaker, Augustus, and GeneMark. For the isoseq data, they used a combination of cupcake, string tie, and pinfish. They used their own version of isoform phasing using Freebase and WhatsApp. Again, if you look at their manuscript, including the supplementary methods, it's actually quite detailed for how they were, they were doing this. So what were they able to accomplish besides, you know, adding all these new genes? So on the table here, we can see the number of protein coding genes, 12,000 of them were added from the use of the ISOSeq data, including some non-protein genes as well. But I think what's really fascinating biologically is they were able to find nested intronic genes. So nested intronic genes are genes that completely reside within the intron of another gene. And this is very difficult to see if you did not have full length information. What they were able to show was the percentage, they estimated that 12% of the exons actually have uh, nested intronic genes in, so this, Formifora californiensis is the um, tinafore that, that was sequenced here. They estimate 12%. And then they plotted it over a range of different species. Now, an interesting point that they pointed out in the manuscript that they said, well, we didn't see a whole lot of nested intronic genes in protists or fungi. But is that an artifact of not having better annotation, or is it really that they're missing? And I think that's an interesting. Um, I think that's an interesting question to be answered. So finally, um, I want to talk a little bit about, so we're, we're going we're moving away from the three stories of genome annotation and kind of going beyond genome annotation about like what are all the not so typical genome annotation problems you have. So one question someone mentioned was, what if I don't have a genome? Can I do genome annotation? And yes, you can. Like this is one of the crazy ideas I had years ago is that what if I just have isoseq data and I don't, I don't want to sequence a large genome. I just, just need the regions that are transcribed to visualize my transcriptome. So the idea I had was if you take the isoseq data from here, you could cluster them based on their Kamer similarity. And this works quite well. You know, there's some edge cases for which it wouldn't work well. So if you have, you know, in human segmental duplicated genes or highly similar paralogs, yes, they will get accidentally clustered together because their Kamer similarity is so high. 
but by and large, you'll be able to identify gene families this way. Then the next crazy thing I did for Cogen was that you could actually reconstruct portions of the genome. We can't reconstruct portions that are not transcribed and not in ISOC data, but you can construct enough of it so that you can actually visualize alternative splicing, as I'm showing here. Another way that we have used Cogen is what if we actually use it to evaluate a genome assembly? Because the nice thing about Cogen is it doesn't care if you have a genome. We could map it to the genome and everything that maps well, sure, it means the genome assembly was just fine. What if we then take what was the trash bin and things that didn't map really well, didn't map at all, and we run it through Cogen. Now we have these kind of basically fake pieces of the genome. We can then map it back to the genome and said, why did you miss this? Is it because you fragmented the assembly or you just didn't assemble it at all? So in this pig paper that we published, we showed that we rescued five missing genes for the pig assembly. So I also want to mention that we can now extend Cogent to, basically Cogent is not a standalone tool. You can combine it when you already have a genome and that's exactly what they did here. So this is a salmon transcriptome. I had no idea salmon is this complicated until this project. Again, the purpose of the flowchart is this is all the detail you need. On the left-hand side, they had used, well, they had some Illumina reads, so they used Lordec to do some error correction. They had their own repeat maskers of the salmon genome was highly repetitive. They ran through Cupcake, then they took Cogent and then created a merged transcriptome. And then they take this merged transcriptome, so the end of this pipeline starts on the right-hand side here, and then goes through trans decoder, a blast, mapping annotation, and you'll notice that they did have a, a reference genome with some prior annotation, so they use Sconti to classify. Again, Scott, the purpose of Sconti is if something is already known, great, it's boring, just keep adding it, right? But then they could use that in combination of things that were novel, that was not in the previous reference annotation and combine that into a final transcriptome, which is now submitted to GenBank. And what about beyond genome annotation? What can you actually do now that you have done genome annotation? Well, obviously with the Arabidopsis, I've already shown that the annotation can help you with differential isoform expression. But just to drive the point home, um, this paper is, uh, has been accepted, hopefully it will come out soon. Uh, where I co-authored a paper on using uh, IsoSeq all the way through all the tools that Keeping talked about, including TAPAS, for looking at differential isomer expression for bear between active and hibernation states. And to create that, that kind of merge transcriptome, this is, this is, we did exactly similar to what the salmon paper did, is we took the IsoSeq transcriptome, we took the original reference transcriptome, we merged them, and then now we have a much larger, more comprehensive transcriptome that we could do differential analysis on. Surprisingly, when you have a good bulk genome annotation, it actually helps your single cell data. I also was not aware that this is possible, but they showed it at an end brain. They did bulk isoseq to annotate the genome. Then they did single cell RNA seq with short reads. And they show that, for example, in this gene, the original reference was missing a lot of the bits and pieces. And that by using the bulk isoseq, they were able to increase the 10x single cell data mapping percentage by 44%. Finally, I'm also just showing you another vignette here. I was recently brought, it was recently brought to my awareness that apparently the yeast genome is poorly annotated in the three prime, uh, sorry, not just the three prime, the five prime and the three prime UTR. And it is, Interesting because I also did not know that once you annotated the through prime UTR very well, it actually increases your single cell ISIS, uh, sorry, your single cell RNA seq uh, processing. So I'm just showing you a poster here. The actual link is down here. The data set is public. This poster is also public. You can take a look at how they used ISO seq to enhance UTR annotation. There are also other ways for quantification. I'm just mentioning two uh, kind of vignettes here. One of them is where they did not even use short read data. They simply used the UMI tagged ISOC data for direct quantification. 
more typically we see what people do is use bulk ISO-seq for genome annotation and then RNA-seq for differential analysis. So that summarizes my talk. And if you're interested to learn more, there are many ways to stay in touch. You could follow me or follow PacBio on Twitter. We also have a very active Google group shown here. And then you can also subscribe and you know watch our GitHub repos to if you're more in, more of the command line type, then definitely um, then definitely follow us on GitHub as well. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, excellent talk, thank you. Um, we do have a question that's come through from uh, Richard Edwards. He asked, um, now that we're getting uh, so efficient sequencing of individual transcripts, how easy is it to distinguish transcriptional noise? For example, erroneous splicing termination. And should we, for example, how easy is it, is it to currently, how easy is it currently to incorporate frequency slash reproducibility information for exploding numbers of isoforms? Uh, is there a poll? <laughs> a poll just there is a poll that just popped up. Yes. <laughs> Well, maybe, maybe I will give people to answer the poll while I answer the question. I, I'm not sure what he, because transcription of noise and reproducibility. So I think what they, I'm, I'm just trying to put that question together. I think what they meant was that, that if you do different, like, let's say if you did technical replicates, is that, is that the question, David? Is that if you did technical replicates of ISOSeq, how much of it, how much of it would be noise? Um, I guess so, yes. So there was a paper by uh, the Talon preprint, which I can put in the link. They looked at the technical reproducibility of PacBio and it was, it was quite high. So I'd say like, yeah, there's always gonna be transcriptional noise. You're gonna, you're gonna always sequence some amount of pre-mRNA, but I think after a decent number of filtering, I, I, I don't think there's gonna be much issue. All right, yeah. okay. Um, all right, does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask Liz directly? Do you want to if you hit the raise hand button, we can um, uh, let you ask directly. Um, if there's any questions coming through? Oh, just getting back to Richard's question again, he's just added more detail. It's more about filling up databases with very rare but real transcripts. Uh I mean, Richard, your goal is like, I want to fill up the data space with rare transcripts. I think this is like, um, it's a never ending quest, right? So look for the uh, Arabi Dopsis. When I look at that preprint, my first thought is, do you really, do you want 30 isoforms? <laughs> if, if, if one of the dominant, and that's the problem is like the dominant one is 90% of your data and you don't know whether the rest of the 10% of that informative. I think that's, it's a hard problem. For, for me to, to, to figure out. Mm, definitely. Um, I've got probably a, a possibly somewhat naive uh, question for you. Um, uh, both ISOSeq and Cogent handle clustering. Is there a fundamental difference between what they're doing? Yes. Uh, so I kind of didn't quite catch that. Yeah, so ISOSeq clustering is trying to cluster full length reads by isoform so it has to understand the full length context of that isoform right so it's looking at multi many reads and said did you come from the same isoform or did you come from a different gene or a different isoform so it has to do basically a global alignment of the reads to each other whereas in cogen there was never a full length alignment it was simply saying do you have similar kamer signatures that that kind of are you above a certain threshold of Kamer similarity that I would say, yeah, you're probably the same gene. You're different isoforms, but you're the same gene. So yeah, that's kind of, it's different. Right, yeah, no, thanks for clarifying. Um, has anyone got any more questions? No one's coming through. Well, I'll tell you what, let's uh, open up the, the questions to anyone who's spoken on the panel. So if you've got a question that you've had a burning desire to ask for anyone who's on the panel, um, now would be a chance to sort of jump in there and ask some questions. And I'll, I'll include panelists if you've got questions that, that you'd like to ask. 
give people a moment. I, I guess from the from the transcript data, I just comment is you know it you know from the plant work and things that I've been involved in. It's what's so hard is that you've got these isoforms, you've got yeah very dominant forms, you've got you know a number of other isoforms that are you know at very low levels, and it's very very difficult to know you know how, how relevant they are. But it's almost impossible to find you know, ways of putting the plants under, say, the appropriate stress. I mean, you mentioned the cold stress, but I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's mechanical stresses, there's temperature stresses, there's chem chemical stresses, there's UV stresses, there's everything that, you know, and, it's, and you know, and, and in combinations of all of that as well. And it's, it's just almost impossible to try and find the conditions where a particular isoform is actually doing, you know, its job or is going to be upregulated or is controlling something. So it's like you say, it's a never ending quest, right? Mm, definitely. All right. I not see any more questions coming in. Um, give it a few more moments. No. Well, if there if there are no other questions, I, I'd really like to thank all of our speakers today uh, for their excellent talks. Um, Thanks uh, also to uh, Karen for managing this session. Um, and thanks obviously to Pack Bio and Millennium for supporting the workshop. Uh, the video for this seminar series will be available um, online soon. I, I believe um, through Millennium will be providing a link. Um, I'd love to thank you all for joining in um, and I hope you've learned something uh, useful as I have. So um, thank you all. Thanks. Thank you everyone. Bye.